With the portal storms on Earth opened up, the naturally occurring fauna located on the planet would not effectively contend with the invading species. Just like how humans would fall in droves, any predators or prey on the planet would have their ecosystems disrupted as virtually all species became prey to the invading alien life forms. With the planet conquered, Earth apart from its atmosphere remaining similar, Earth would appear quite alien to humans should they visit from another timeline. One of the main culprits concerning the destruction of Earth's animals were the antlions. Antlions are the most invasive species and would annihilate any animal, even humans, located outside of the cities. So, in this episode, we will discuss where the antlions from Half-Life come from and what were the consequences of their invasion, but also discuss how these creatures would immediately game end after entering our atmosphere. I believe the best way to start this off is we will begin with the larvae and work our way up to the mutated guardians. As with any insect on Earth, the young needed to be protected within the colony and the antlions, despite forming on another planet, are no different. When the invasion first began, the first order of business was to establish a colony. Here is where we see our first examples of the antlines and their beginnings. Antline grubs are unsurprisingly the larval forms of antlines. They resemble the larva on Earth, except much larger, which is to be expected considering the size of the antlines in general. Their bodies are soft and translucent, and they are carnivorous as there can be seen human bodies that they were snacking on throughout their entire colony. The main disadvantage to being a larva is that you're extremely fragile, so fragile that even bumping into one will cause a pop and a squishy mess. Interestingly, like the silkworms on Earth, they will still emit this material which can be found all over their colonies. In some instances, as within the mine, they can block off entire sections of the mine, which may actually be pretty useful in terms of a defense method to keep out scavengers, which would probably likely eat them. Grubs have been known to contain a yellow substance that has healing properties, making them a source of medicine. So I'm gonna go ahead and drop a hypothesis on you and say that the Vortigons and the Antlines actually evolved on the same planet together, or at least have had interactions with one another so that their evolutionary paths have become intertwined, mainly because they talk about their ancestral practice of harvesting the antlines. Should the larva make it through and not become popped underfoot by a crowbar-wielding mad lad wearing an HEV suit, it seems as though there are roughly two forms the larva will grow into. How it is determined is not all that known, seeing as the antline method of breeding appears to be just soldiers from what we know in Half-Life 2, but screw it, we're gonna take a stab at it anyways and see what we get. The first form the larva can take is the antline soldier. This appears to be the most basic, and antline soldiers are really the bread and butter of the insect army. They are responsible for hunting down any remaining humans on Earth Earth and eating those humans. They will return back with their prey and feed them to the larva. Your standard soldier measures roughly about 6 feet or 1.8 meters in length and at a height of around 3 to 5 feet tall or about 1 to 1.5 meters tall. They possess a massively powerful carapace which protects them during hunts and makes melee against them virtually useless. Interestingly, their legs are structured rather strangely. The back legs will move over the front legs when walking and the front legs will move behind the back legs. This gives them sort of an awkward gait but they are extremely fast nonetheless. They possess three mouth parts tipped with sharp teeth used for piercing any armor worn and the hide of any animal. The head is flattened out and can be used as a battering ram to break bones in the body but presumably it was originally used to break the carapace of perhaps other colony soldiers. The claws on each foot are used to inflict damage upon another that can ultimately be fatal. Antlion soldiers are highly sociable creatures and utilize this socialization to hunt effectively. Considered to be pack members they will bury themselves in the sand which we will all see along the coastline. They can then sense the vibrations within the ground and wait until prey gets closer. They will ambush the prey and take them out almost immediately and drag them off to the colony. This can be used against them as well though. Known to the alien overlords as the Combine, thumpers were used to smack the ground. This sends out vibrations that will cause great discomfort to the antline soldiers. Apart from utilization of your handheld, this is really the only major defense the Combine or a human has against these invaders. The hunting is also aided by the ability of the antline soldier to fly. Seemingly whatever planet they evolved on had a similar gravity composition to Earth. As such, they were able to use these wings to fly to reach higher places, meaning that if you are in a two-story building or behind a wall, you are likely not safe from the flight ability and you can be brought down despite being up higher than surface level. Something to note about the antline soldiers is that unlike the ants that occur on our own planet right now, where only the queen mates, apparently the spawning season has been marked as occurring during a specific point in year, but the antline soldiers become more aggressive during this time, which means that they are also spawning, so it's not just the queen. This may also explain why they have been so successful at conquering an environment. They are all able to spawn with one another, leading to a massive amount of numbers. So the secondary form that a larva can take appears to be one that specifically builds the colony or busts through the streets in any city that's not protected. You need your soldiers and you need your workers. The antline workers differ from the soldiers in ability to attack and overall morphology. However, in some aspects, they are still similar to the antline soldier brethren. These workers are much sleeker and adept at moving around their colony. They are not really used as a defensive measure, but they do 
do still have the ability to defend as a last resort. Their head is much more smooth and less bolstered than the soldiers. On top of this, they do not possess the raised carapace on their hind area. Instead, it is a much smaller and tapered hind end. The mouth has an extra part numbering four, and there appears to be an extra set of arms on the front visible, though they are much smaller than the other front arms. These arms may be used to clear away rubble, and the worker wings that they have can be used for temporary flight, but are much smaller than that of the soldiers. For this reason, they are slower and cannot fly as far, but this would clearly be an adaptive trait as they are found more underground than hunting above ground. Speaking of clearing rubble, let's discuss their ability to absolutely destroy rocks. That's pretty metal. This particular antline has been equipped with acid spit that can be used to melt rocks. This spit can also be used in a defensive nature, but what form does this spit take? Well, in theory, it could be carbonic acid like we all see with acid rain. Technically, this would melt rocks given enough time. But considering how fast the workers build a colony and how much damage it does to your meat suit, the pH level would be much lower than the level of carbonic acid. Instead, I would propose that it's actually hydrofluoric acid. Hydrofluoric acid is a chemical that it might be working with for a few reasons. The first reason is its ability at which it dissolves rocks. It is known that these colonies were established very quickly, which would require digging tunnels and dissolving away rock. Hydrofluoric acid is extremely powerful and would have the ability to do this in perhaps hours or days, as opposed to carbonic acid, which could take years. Not to mention, if you look around some of the cities where currently the thumpers aren't being used, there's plenty of holes in the ground through rows to suggest that these things have actually been melted. The second reasoning is its defensive nature. Should anyone tread within the colony, these workers can eventually fire an acid ball at a person. To someone not in an HEV suit, this would quickly cause skin damage, leading to shock and ultimate game end. Gordon is able to survive a direct hit because of his suit, but seeing as hydrofluoric acid is actually used in metalworking, it's not too far-fetched to think that this acid could be damaging the suit to a certain degree, and also damaging Gordon in the process. One more thing to note also about the acid in terms of what it does to your body is it does possess a slight neurotoxin, which can completely incapacitate you should you not be able to get away from the antline. So, pretty good in terms of defensive nature. The third reasoning is that upon game-ending a worker, they will energetically combust and shower an area causing splash damage. Now, why do they do this? I believe that their body has the ability to produce hydrogen and more than likely picks up fluoride from the surrounding area while tunneling. When this happens, they are able to combine it at will and create the acid they need. Should they be game into it, however, this hydrogen gas is still built up in their system. An internal mechanism may exist that combusts the gas, which then detonates the antline worker. As this is happening, acid may have already been formed or perhaps forming shortly after ignition, and this showers the area. This acid is, as I mentioned previously, a known neurotoxin, which, again, isn't too strange considering most of the animals that exist within the Zen universe appear to be toxic to humans in some form or another. Moving up the hierarchy, we see that the antlines begin to get larger. The antline guards stand roughly 8 to 10 feet tall or 2.4 to 3 meters tall. These are the insects that keep order within the colony itself, but are more found outside the perimeter of it rather than in the actual colony. They will patrol the outside and are the main defense for stopping anything from entering. The power contained within this creature means that it's able to fight multiple combined soldiers at once and usually come out on top or at least having even the score. They will use their thick carapace and charging ability to headbutt other animals and parting a massive amount of force. This is enough to completely pulverize bones into dust and cause internal hemorrhaging and organ damage that is not survivable. They can also throw objects using this force to cause injury to whoever they are attacking at that particular point in time. Much like other ant lines, the clear line of relation is shown via the legs it possesses. Two up front, two in the back, with the legs crossing over when they walk. The hard exoskeleton is larger than that of the ant line soldiers and much more stronger to boot. Is more stronger the correct grammar? Probably not. But even with its formidable abilities, the creature possesses an even worse trait that makes it exceedingly dangerous in battle. When the antline guard begins its attack, it has the ability to command antline soldiers via a pheromone gland. This is also why I believe the Vortigaunts may have evolved on the same planet or just had their interactions with these antlines for a very long time. Vortigaunts will harvest this pheromone sack to control the antline soldiers and throw it at the combine. After Gordon makes his way through the beach, he is able to do the same after it's harvested. Regardless, this pheromone will cause the soldiers to aid in an attack and defend the colony with unrivaled ferocity. Seemingly, the fresh gland can actually override a harvested gland, suggesting that maybe there is more than just a singular gland that is attributed to the ability to control these soldiers. So finally, deep within the colony, there is one that is tasked with keeping everything safe. And this is where we get to the antline guardian, not to be confused with the antline guard. Almost completely identical to the antline guards, you may be surprised to know that they actually had their own classification for specific reasons. These particular beasts possess all the same traits and abilities of the antline guards. However, instead of patrolling the outside of the nest, they keep the larvae safe internally and maintain order as well. The interesting thing about these creatures is that they 
also possess a bioluminescence not seen in other ant lines except for the larva. This may actually be for a good reason as well. Seeing as it is quite dark in the colony, they possess this light despite having no eyes. Perhaps there are versions of ant lines that can see and this makes them easier to spot. Regardless, the creature also contain the ability to administer a neurotoxin capable of incapacitating any humans fairly quickly. There is also the theory that the light exists within their body as a form of radiation. And considering how wrecked the planet is after the invasion of the combine, a nuclear meltdown irradiating this creature really isn't that far-fetched. So looking at these creatures, you may think that they have no natural predators, but it seems as though the barnacles like snacking on ant lines as much as they like eating human heads. Should any wander too close to these barnacles, they will be picked up by the sticking out protrusion that hangs down. One of the naturally occurring sort of self-defenses against this is really just how to protect the colony. The ant line workers will actually detonate taking out the barnacle and themselves. This defense would make sense seeing as the barnacles would exist within the caves where the workers would be, and these are the same caves where the larvae are. So keeping the larvae alive would be integral to the species survival, which comes at the cost of a single worker. So now it's time to talk about the elephant in the room, or maybe the ant line in the room. Looking at the exoskeleton clad insects, we have to ask ourselves, would they even survive on Earth in the first place? So let's dive into a little history lesson about our own planet. Long ago existed giant insects on Earth. These insects were several feet in length, and I'm talking like a centipede was somewhere around eight to nine feet long. They were capable of hunting down other giant bugs, and they did very well. However, they didn't just exist because of existence. Around the time, the leading theory is, is that the oxygen levels on Earth may have been as high as 30%, as opposed to the 21% we currently breathe now. This allowed for more oxygen to be taken in with each breath, saturating the body through their tiny little tubes that they have within them. On top of this, insects do not have a dedicated circulatory system. Circulatory systems are how we move oxygen around our bodies now and are able to be as large as we are. If we had open segmented bodies like the insects do, we would be just as small. So efficiency is the name of the game. Our bodies are more efficient at moving oxygen, so we are larger. Insects are not. So as oxygen levels dipped on Earth, their bodies compensated by becoming smaller. Ant lines are massive. And whenever you take one out, it appears to be a homogenous green and yellow mixture. There does not seem to be a circulatory system present, and instead, they have bodies very similar to the insects on Earth. Through my findings in the lore, however, or really anyhow, no mention of a circulatory system exists either. So seeing as this is the case, we would have to assume that they just do not have one in place. The planet they evolved on would need similar levels of gravity to that of Earth, maybe even less gravity than Earth, but it may have had higher oxygen levels. Actually, no, it would needed to have had higher oxygen levels for this creature to exist in the first place. After exiting the portals onto Earth, these insects would quickly have suffocated under their own body's demands. It would have been like you stepping out of a portal onto Mount Everest. The low level of oxygen would render you unconscious within minutes, despite technically being oxygen surrounding you, and the same would definitely happen to the antlions. So biologically, they are fascinating organisms, but the feasibility of them existing on Earth would make very little sense as surely they are still bound by biological constants, and there is no way that these creatures could adapt to an atmosphere change that quickly and on top of it remain the same size they are and completely wipe out the local fauna as well as humans. It's, it's just too much. So are you an entomologist? Do you agree or disagree? Let me know in the comments. I hope everyone enjoyed my video over the antline variants. If you did, leave a like and if you're new, something is a great way to keep up with the channel. Also, my second channel has the video on werewolf syndrome up. If you want to go check out that, its name is Croton Medical. I will drop a link in the description and pinned comment. I'll also drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon merch links and I'd like to thank a few of my patrons. Huge shout out to It's Not a Spoon and Laffy No Skill. I also want to thank Freedom Units 44 and Skilt. And to the rest of my patrons, I really do appreciate the support. You guys are awesome and it really does help. Uh, okay, so just a quick blurb. The second channel, I got the green screen or I ordered it anyways and I got the camera. Uh, we're doing this live. It's going to be lit. All right, anyways, hope y'all enjoyed and I will see y'all in the next one.